Before this podcast, we would like to give a massive thanks to Keith at KMR Audio, who has provided us with all the equipment we have needed to launch our podcast. Keith has hooked us up with some premium equipment, and if you're in the market yourself for some high-end audio recording equipment, then head over to kmraudio.com. The bows are shown. The bows are shown. The bows are shown. Hello and welcome to The Ball Sessions, a podcast where we delve into the lives and stories of successful millennials. My name's Henry Martin and I'm joined by Ross Jeffries. Hello Henry. And Tom West. Good afternoon Henry. For session three, we're hugely excited to be joined by Jeremy Hindle, co-founder of Head Start. Jeremy, thank you very much for coming along. Hi, thank you for having me. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. It's been, it's been a long day. Last night was a, was a late one. <laughs> yeah. we, have, uh, we, we were lucky enough to get uh, Forbes 30 under 30 wow. so, uh, for social entrepreneurship. Which was pretty awesome. Well but, done, uh, man. Hanging a little bit today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Make it even more interesting, I think. Exactly, yeah. Oh. Okay, so just to start off the podcast, Jeremy, can you tell us a bit about your, uh, your background kind of before, before Head Start? Well, uh, Head Start's actually my third business. Okay. Um, so it's quite a long background, so I'll try and keep it short. <laughs> you, can, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. Can, uh, you can ask me about uh, whichever bits you're most interested in. Um, but I guess uh, I, went, I, I was very lucky. I had really good schooling. Uh, I, I went to Eton College. Um, I uh, eventually, want, I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to be a brain surgeon, um, that was my kind of goal, and so I went to university and I did neuroscience. <laughs> While I was there, decided I didn't want to be a neuroscientist, um, <laughs> for a whole bunch of reasons, um, and kind of, I was learning how to program, so I self-taught myself to program during that, mm-hmm. during that course, and ended up building uh, one of the largest Minecraft communities online. Uh, which I taught myself to program whilst doing because oh, I wow. built like uh, tools to keep children safe online, uh, things for children with learning difficulties, stuff like that. And I taught myself Java, which was my entry uh, entry to the ent- entry to the programming world. Um, and then I struggled to get a job. Like I really, really struggled. Mm. Um, I, I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do. Uh, you'd think nowadays if you have a neuroscience degree, you can pretty much walk into any job you want. But, you know, back then, so this is seven years ago now, uh, for me, neuroscience wasn't quite as cool. It was just about to become cool. Um, and uh, I applied to uh, WPP. I applied to GSK. I applied to all the grad mm-hmm. schemes. I applied to Accenture. Okay. All of these kind of companies. And I had very, very little success because I wasn't um, I wasn't one of the people who kind of fit into what they were looking for because I was a medic student, basically. Mm-hmm. And, and they like medic students. So if I'd done medicine, it would have been fine. Yeah. But because I did neuroscience, it wasn't really on their radar. Um, I also applied to loads of games companies and was also very unsuccessful. Were there yeah. any like weird excuses that they gave to? Because it almost sounds like you'd have to be overqualified as a neuroscientist. O- do you overqualified think? was one. Really? Yeah. Def- definitely got your your way overqualified. But I just wanted a job, right? Yeah. yeah. This is literally for like the entry level internship, like at the very very bottom. Mm. Um, for technical roles, I didn't have any experience, right? So it's in the normal experience excuses. Yeah. And games industry is just really competitive. And uh, my my second company, I got to laugh at some people because of that. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so if if we're jumping back to when you're at university, yeah. what was it that made you suddenly decide oh, I don't want to be a doctor anymore? I don't want to follow this path. <laughs> It's 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 quite a tough question. I think uh, it's quite personal. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that at the core of it, I don't I don't like how the NHS is run for doctors right now. I feel like because they need more doctors, they've increased the amount of regulation so that they don't have to have doctors who can handle as much as possible. So doctors mm-hmm. are given stronger guidelines on what they have to do. So one of the areas which I particularly struggle with is how patient confidentiality, confidentiality. Mm -hmm. so for example, if you know somebody's got a problem, you can't tell their friends, even if it's to protect them, and that means you have to rely on that person. Mm -hmm. I had several occasions where people came in with STDs and things like that, have been on holiday with other halves, and you can't tell the other half when they go home, um, Mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and that, I I basically kind of ended up deciding that I would either become a doctor who was incredibly bitter, because I'd never be able to do what I I felt was right, Mm Or I'd end up losing my license, in which case, what's the point in get, getting, <laughs> one, getting one in the first place? Yeah. So I think that that was the core of it. And also, um, as I became better and better at programming and my community, um, I gave like informal counseling sessions to lots of children and helped them deal with like their problems mm-hmm. and also adults as well. Um, and all the things that we had in our community um, it was a very special time for me. I realized that through technology and potentially through games as well, I felt that I could actually help more people than I could by being a doctor. 
And that was probably more fulfilling in terms of yourself and the people that you sort of helped through their journeys. Yeah, I mean, in in, in our community, uh, there were uh, we had people from. Um, we had the youngest person in our community was a five-year-old autistic kid who would mm-hmm. play with his mother, uh, and the eldest was a fifty-six-year-old trucker. And in the middle, we had okay. uh, astrophysicists, we had uh, Air Force uh, engineers, mm-hmm. uh, we had uh, Air Force pilots. We had so we had it was a very inspirational environment, and a lot of children who um, wouldn't wouldn't have been exposed to those kind of things uh, wouldn't have even considered. For example, there were lots of uh, uh, kids from Texas who yeah. would never have even considered going to college. Yeah. Like their parents have never gone to college. Yeah. They would never have wanted a higher education. Um, we had girls in Saudi Arabia who were very culturally different environments. They couldn't, their parent, mother couldn't drive and things like that. And it was, it was a really enlightening experience for, for a lot of people. Um, and I still get messages today from uh, parents now and also uh, some of the kids being like, oh, I've just finished college. I graduated. Like, I can't believe it. I did this because of you or X or Y in, mm-hmm. in our community. Um, and during the period of time, I, I think I, I really liked it. I don't think I fully appreciated um, quite what I was doing. Um, in the, if I had, I think it might have paralyzed me a little bit because yeah. uh, I would have been very nervous about how much I was affecting young people's lives. Mm-hmm. Um, especially as like, you know, a 21 year old, like 20, 21 year old, actually, I, I don't know whether that amount of responsibility is okay consciously. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, I, I think, I think you're right. Um, it was, it was a really special time and I think I've helped a lot more people, um, that way than I would have done, uh, in a medical career. So just to quickly describe like exactly how did the community come about? Like, how did you go around about building it? Well, um, it's very early adopter of Minecraft. So uh, Minecraft actually, interestingly, um, is available on all platforms. So it's available on Linux. Mm -hmm. Um, And I happen to have a really, really crappy laptop while I was at university, which couldn't play games, right? So I had Linux on it, so it could run faster. Mm -hmm. So it was quick. And I wanted to play games. Like, I loved games. Like, I, I played a lot of games when I was younger. Um, not not because my parents liked them. In fact, they hated them. It's probably why I like them even more. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Minecraft was in its early stages pretty difficult to run. Mm. And I think I, at the same time as learning to program, I also learned how to kind of really understand how systems worked. Yeah. So how servers worked and, and all of that kind mm. of thing. Because I had this crap computer basically and I wanted to do these things. Um, and basically, I just became very, very good at running Minecraft on Linux more efficiently than anyone else. And uh, I think I was, I was definitely one of the first like 20 servers that ever like kind of went up, like the big mm-hmm. ones. And then it also, because it was a private community and it was also a relatively strict community, uh, a lot of streamers and YouTubers played on it. And we became very well known. Let's Play Minecraft was the best Minecraft server. Okay. And so we had waiting lists of over a year to get in. It was very um, surreal. Uh, and um, so yeah. how long was the server running for? Is it still? No, it's still down now. Um, I shut it down uh, uh, when my computer games company uh, took off. Okay. I couldn't manage both things at the same time. Mm-hmm. I really wish uh, I had the knowledge that I have now because I probably would have set up an entity to continue running it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and also just because it was it was actually a really special place for a lot of people. Um, I think more important to a lot of people than I even appreciated at that time. Uh, and I feel bad because I kind of let a few people down, I think. Mm. Um, you know, but you know, mistakes. Yeah. Okay. So you've been to university and decided not to become a neuroscientist. Yeah. You've built the community. Uh, You've left university and struggled to get a job. Yeah. So what, what happened next? Like what was the next kind of step in the journey? So I got a job through Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) Networking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got a job through Twitter from a a guy called, um, I won't say his real name in case Mm -hmm. he doesn't want it public. Although I'm pretty sure it is now. He was, he was a big YouTuber. He was one of the, he was part of the big growth, right? Uh, And he used to film so weirdly. He used to film um, videos for uh, a company called Language Lab. uh, And he knew uh, the head of community. I think she was at the time there. Uh, and he tweeted out saying like, oh, they're looking for somebody to go and literally just build computers in their office. Like just for like, I think it was 400 quid just to build like six or something computers. Mm-hmm. And I needed money, right? I didn't have a job. My parents were basically, my parents don't understand computers or games. So at the time they weren't particularly supportive of what I was doing, nor did they understand. I didn't even appreciate what I had and they didn't, they definitely didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was like, okay, well I need some money. So, um, I took the job, went in and, um, uh, they offered me a full-time role and I became head of IT there in less than six months. Wow. 
Um, so that was that was a mixture between I think there was a lot of luck involved and that there was uh, certain issues within the company financially, which uh, they wanted to cut down on their staff costs. And there was a okay. good opportunity for somebody who was very good mm -hmm. for what they costed. Uh, uh, you could say they took advantage of me to a certain extent, yeah. but then at the same time, they gave me a qualification, which basically meant I didn't need qualifications from that point mm -hmm. onwards. Um, so yeah, that, that was my, that was my first break into a technical role. Um, and, uh, it was also during there that I met sort of like my only major mentor, a uh, guy called David Helgerson, who's the founder of Unity 3D. Um, he really inspired me when I went to a conference. Um, and that, that was the moment where I finally got to like actually work within the games industry. It was a, it was a great moment for me. Cause that was like your kind of dream from. Yeah. I mean, uh, why, why, uh, well. When I was younger, um, I, I've actually been terminally ill twice. Uh, I've had cancer. I've had Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, the first time was when I was five, second time was when I was nine. Uh, and when I was nine, I spent most of the year in hospital. And one of the only ways that I could really experience anything other than within the hospital was through computer games. Mm -hmm. So I had a very strong, and I still do, I think they have, computer games have a very, uh, they have a very unique way of allowing people to escape yeah. their current yeah. conditions and also to inspire people so fictional characters are engaging and they can be like good mentors to particularly children and games are more engaging than cartoons or um comics and things like that so you can actually become even more attached to them so ga games became very important to me back then and i think that that stayed with me my whole life like a lot of my motivation in order to be able to achieve the things i've achieved i've happened, actually happened looked in at your early years and yeah. that was that connection yeah. and i and i just looked at computer games and I looked at their stories and I was just like, well, you know, it sounds really naive and stupid, but I think it played a big part in where I got a lot of my motivation from when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Not any, not anymore, but it definitely helped me when I was younger a lot. Yeah. That's actually interesting. I was listening to, I think it was the How I Built This podcast the other day and they do a little bit at the end where they get someone who's kind of got a early startup business mm. and the business, it was actually a charity which um, provides people kids basically just kids who are in hospital with you know terrible illnesses with like vr headsets and stuff yeah. so they can kind of like you said sort of escape from escape. it yeah mm -hmm. so so there's there's a charity which i particularly love uh called special effects mm -hmm. um, and they basically build um interfaces so ways for for people who are severely disabled um to play computer games so they can kind of escape and do things which they would never normally be able to do because games controllers aren't built for people who mm. have motor neuron disease and things like yeah, that yeah of so. course so it's, yeah, it's really very, very good charity. Because I, I know there's like a big opinion about computer games sort of being detrimental to young people. Yeah. But for you, that kind of Couldn't almost like more wrong, up, could it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, like set up your career almost. Yeah, it, it did. I, uh, without the games industry, I would be nowhere near where I am today, both from an emotional point of view when I was younger and also from a technolo technological point of view. The games mm -hmm. industry is actually a pioneer in pretty much everything right now, even machine learning right now, mm. all graphics card development, which is powering all of the machine learning algorithms around the world has been pushed forward by the games industry. Um, also, uh, I, I have a massive propensity towards um, programmers from the games industry because it's one of the hardest things to program for. Mm -hmm. If you're building something complicated in games, mostly because there's so many different factors you have to consider, which means when you get somebody, they might not be the strongest programmer, but they will be a very good problem solver. Uh, which is a great technique and then mm. you can train them to be a great programmer mm -hmm. and then they're naturally a fantastic problem solver so um no games industry I, I i absolutely love i don't doubt that there are some bad games for yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah of course um yeah. i'm i'm a strong believer in um that if you can i used to say this with like a hundred percent like certainty i think uh, as i've matured i've seen that change a little bit um but i genuinely believe on the on the whole if you're doing some sort of creative activity and you're building something or you're uh, trying to achieve something together with other people, mm -hmm. I'm pretty much 100% sure that that game will be good. It, it encourages communication. It encourages collaboration and problem solving. So any creative building game, Minecraft was outstanding for so many people mm -hmm. around the world. Fantastic game. And, and talking about games, what, what games do you play now? Now? Oh, um... <laughs> I guess I play I play a bit of I play League of Legends very badly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I try to only play with people I know. It's it's much more of a fun thing rather than a super competitive thing. But yeah. comp competition can be fun. I'm a big fan of CD Projekt Red and the mm -hmm. Witcher Three series, which okay. with the whole Witcher series in particular. Um, so yeah, I, those kind of games. I like big open world RPGs, good okay. story, really good characters, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Awesome stuff. Um, okay, so you've got the first job. What 
what was your de development from there? Like, because obviously then you've sort of started to become an entrepreneur after that. So um, I, I guess it wouldn't, I, I would say that it would be nice if everything was just really nice and everything sort of like flowed on, but mm -hmm. it, it didn't really. Uh, what actually happened was um, I, I became a very, very good uh, Unity 3D developer. So that's the game engine developer. Mm -hmm. While I was working there, I was going to build their new platform. They were raising money against it. Uh, and I had a falling out with uh, the CEO at the time. Um, mostly around the fact that I was being paid very, very little. Like, I'm being paid less than what you'd be paid on a grad scheme, and I'm basically the thing which is sitting on the back of a four million pound raise mm -hmm. on my own yeah. at that particular point in I time. I can see why you had a slight yeah. disagreement. Well, <laughs> well I, 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 I felt that I would have liked to have been offered some equity, basically, given the fact that it was happening. And how much? I don't really know. I mean, at that point, I didn't really know how much equity you can ask for in a company which has been running for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, but the point was he was meant to bring it up at the board. And I found out from um, the chairman of the board, because I was doing some stuff for him on the weekends, that he had not. Uh, and I left the company pretty quickly uh, and became unemployed again. Yeah. Um, and wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. However, at the time, I think I was pretty, I think, honestly, I was probably pretty bitter. I didn't want to work for people anymore mm. um, because I didn't trust people. Uh, and I, don't, I wouldn't say that was a particularly good time, but I was lucky that uh, I ended up living in a flat uh, with a friend of mine who was working as, uh, I think he was just an uh, intern at the very beginning, um, at a firm called Roundhill Capital, which is a private equity firm. They specialize in real estate. He was working there and I was just at home. And <laughs> it was the silliest thing. Uh, they had an issue with their Dropbox syncing. Um, like literally, like simple stuff. And this is like, uh, they're, they're, pretty high, they're pretty high value as a, as a private equity firm. And... Uh, my friend Charles uh, was just like, oh, you should, you should come in. You should just come in and fix it. Jeremy, I guarantee you Jeremy will be able to fix it. So I went into their office one day and they were like, go wherever you want, right? Just, just fix this problem. Like <laughs> we keep deleting all of our files <laughs> and we have to keep ringing Dropbox. This is before Dropbox had a proper backup system. So yeah. you have to ring them to be like, we've deleted all our files. <laughs> <laughs> please, please just, just bring them all back. <laughs> it's, hap it's happened again, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, what it turned out was is that somebody had it on an external hard drive and every single time they left their desk, they went, and okay. if their computer stayed open when they walked out of that <laughs> office, it would, st it would delete the files. Um, and um, I only saw this, like any computer technician would have identified that. The only reason why I saw this was because I was lucky enough that the person who brought me in was like really close friends with the founder of that firm. Yeah. And he was like, you can go wherever you want. And I walked into one of the partner's rooms and saw it happening. Yeah. Like it was nothing to do with the fact that I was good. It was pure it was luck. Pure luck. It mm. was, it was, I was very lucky. Um, and then... Uh, the guy who, who kind of looked after me there was a guy called Archer. Uh, he kind of did all the technical, uh, the technical evaluation of their investments. Mm -hmm. And he was just like, you should pitch for a new project. And I was like, really? I was like, <laughs> he was like, yeah, yeah, pitch. It's going to be good. Like, I think you'd be really good for it anyway. So I pitched for it and I got it. <laughs> um, and it was a, uh, they had just bought this company called uh, Nido Student Living, mm -hmm. uh, which was a, like a mid to high tier uh, student accommodation company for private student accommodation. So mostly international students, right? Um, in London, they had three buildings. And um, I think this was the point where I really kind of got real business experience. Um, and what happened was is there were two consultants put on the project, one of mm -hmm. which was me. So yeah. I was the technical consultant for this whole project. Mm -hmm. And the other consultant who worked with me on it, who led mostly, led pretty much everything except the technical stuff, uh, was a guy called Chris Chinloy, who was the ex-CMO of Made.com. Okay. okay. And um, he, I guess, was like a short-term mentor for me in that he taught me how to um, motivate teams uh, very effectively. I've always been very good at motivating people who are already excited, yeah. <laughs> but it's very different when you're motivating somebody who's like, my business has been bought for the second time in the last 10 years, like all of the all, all the stuff's gonna change mm -hmm. again. and. Um, I had to kind of like be like, oh, you're going to use Salesforce, so I'm going to train you to use Salesforce. Yeah. <laughs> it's like how to motivate a sales team to do that. And he taught me a lot of that thing. And our, our brief was we had 80 million pounds mm -hmm. to build the most luxurious and technologically advanced student accommodation in the world. Okay. That was our brief. Wow. Um, he used to say we did that. I got to do some really, really cool things there. Uh, but eventually it, they sold it for something like a 300 million profit in like a, fi in like a four year period. I only worked on it for about a year and a half. Yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, decent profit, isn't it? In any yeah. way, <laughs> yeah. oh, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, mm. And then uh, in the middle, um, the chairman of the original company I was working at 
said, hey, do you want to start a computer games company? I know you want to do that. I'll fund it. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, I jumped at that, jumped off of that project, which I was working on um, because I'd done like most of the implementation yep. and left it in a good state and um, got to run my own computer games company. And that, that was the, ne that was the next mm -hmm. chapter. And do you mind me asking kind of what age this was when you started your yeah. computer game company? The computer games company would have been maybe end of 2012, I think, mm -hmm. was what it was. And would you say you preferred that more? Was it everything that you'd hoped for, given it was almost your, your dream? During running that business, I realized that uh, my favorite thing, it wasn't actually games. I loved um, making people the best they can be. Uh, so every single developer I hired at um, Omnigon Games was the name of the company uh, to work on the pro game called Yumi U. It's spelt weirdly, U-E-M-E-U. -E -E um, I still get messages about it today. It's quite mm. upsetting sometimes. Um, and um, all of the people we hired, none of them had ever worked in the games industry before. I hired out, out of goldsmiths. Okay. Some of them had done math. Some of them had done game design. So not even mm -hmm. like able to program and very well and things like that. Um, and I taught them all from scratch. And they became like, you know, fucking good. Really? Yeah, and uh, it was like 100%, like it basically gave me a really strong belief in people that if you have mm. the motivations and the belief and you care about what you want to be good at, you can, you can, you can become really good at it. Mm -hmm. Like even if you're not naturally the most gifted person, you can become really good. And um, that's what we did. And we became a 10-man studio who was being compared with 500 and 600-man studios with literally like 300 times our budget. Mm -hmm. um, we had a huge player base in comparison to some of those games at the very beginning because of my Minecraft history it really helped with that as yeah. well because uh, the community was still running this whole time right yeah. in the background um, and uh, it was a sandbox game and we were called like uh, the next generation sandbox Minecraft for graduates was one of the titles which people wrote right. about us a lot okay. and I would regularly talk about how it's because tooling had got so good how game engines like Unity 3D had truly mm. like succeeded in their goals of democratizing games development like anyone who wanted to really can make games and that's still mm. true today like anyone can it's a bit of a saturated market now actually yeah <laughs> it, um, yeah it like really strikes me that your kind of career progression even from sort of like the first two jobs was like already high level do you know yeah. what i mean like they kind of the first company brought you on and you quickly sort of moved up the ranks and it's something i haven't really heard of before because now there's yeah. a big thing about kind of starting you know you start on the grad scheme for example and then you really work your way up but yours was like pretty swift rise yeah and and like i said i think that was to do with the fact that i went into a small business i mm -hmm. think that that's something you get more in small companies um and i think it also is tech because yeah. in tech, it doesn't matter. Like a 14 year old could walk up to me at a conference and tell me mm. that they could write a better algorithm than me. And I would not pass them off. I'd be like, please show me, please show me how good you are. Mm. And then I'd be like, cool. When are you leaving school? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't need to go to uni. Come, <laughs> work, come, come work with us. We've got a great team. Mm. Um, so uh, I, think, I think those two things put together uh, meant that I had an accelerated, at least career progression. Yeah. Um, I think my technical progression was then accelerated by the fact that I had to. Hmm. And then I just had to deliver. And, and luckily I did for the most part. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I made plenty of mistakes um, along the way, but uh, they certainly didn't get picked up on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, <laughs> you were good enough. Yeah. I, 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 I was good enough. And I think that during the periods of each of the times that I was doing something, I became very good at what mm. I did. Yeah. Um, and I think that's because I was obsessed. Um, I definitely uh, uh, let important parts of my life uh so like my friends family mm -hmm. uh, my family particularly i alienated a lot during that period of time because i was just completely focused on my work mm -hmm. and not because i wanted money or success or anything like that it was i just loved what i was doing and i finally got an opportunity to do do something i really wanted to do after being rejected mm -hmm. by so many companies yeah um and uh it was it was a very special time for me and obviously when i run the run, run our games company we got invested in by jagex game studios mm -hmm. moved to cambridge um and then i just became even more obsessed right because i was building this game and we had all of these users who were incredibly passionate about it so like all i was thinking about was like how can i make all these people happy mm. almost like uh like a, a celebrity might be in that the fact that they're always like having to create more content always, mm -hmm. which i think is really bad for mental health by the way um but i kind of mm -hmm. had this but i wanted to build the best sandbox game ever right and i kind of put this huge amount of pressure on myself and i didn't dislike the pressure i kind of relished in it 
Um, but it meant that I disregarded pretty much everything else in my life. Um, so I wouldn't say it came free. I think the progression yeah. came at a cost. Mm. Um, and I think it's because I went into a small business and I also got lucky because of their financial circumstances and because I then, then after all of those things like lined up, I delivered. Yeah. Um, I, so, so I think it's defi definitely possible and I think people can do it. I mean, more now than ever, particularly in technology. Um, but in other industries, I still think a standard career progression path is most likely the, the safest route to go. Of course. Yeah. In hindsight, would you say you would change anything with how you, Ooh. with the way you were, or was it just that hunger that you just almost couldn't stop it and that's just who you are and you just were quite intense for that period of your life? One of the reasons why I might say no is because I was never nasty to anyone. Mm. I was always a very nice person. Yeah. Um, in fact, that's what ended up kind of biting me in the ass eventually. Trying to keep everyone happy. At no, no, no. At the same like, time, um, trusting people too much mm. in business, uh, which was one of the reasons why my games company no longer is mine. Uh, okay. Uh, so it was almost like the fact that you believed everyone was as trusting as you, and I evangelized the games industry and thought everyone in the games industry was great. Mm -hmm. Not everyone in the games industry is great. Um, a lot are. I don't. I'm not discouraging people from getting yeah. into it, but <laughs> every industry has bad eggs. Yeah. But you'd not change. You wouldn't change yourself and the way you were. Because I would have looked after my health better. But that's an obvious one, right? Um, I was when I was uh, after I was ill. I was really fat until I was about 17 years old. Mm -hmm. Then I lost all my weight, so I became really sporty, mm -hmm. like good shape. I modeled for Abercrombie and Fitch for a bit. Oh, wow. <laughs> like cool. I, I used to do topless nights in Mahiki nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, did they, had they asked you or did you just turn no, up no, anyway? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely one to take my shirt off in clubs up in Nottingham at uni for sure. Um, but yeah, they, they, they did pay me. It was, uh, it was a proper job. So yeah. have you always been kind of confident with people then? So you kind of going back to your early days, you said you kind of played a lot of games yeah. uh, and kind of with your illnesses and stuff. Uh, one would potentially kind of expect a, a slightly more shy individual, but yeah, is no, that not the case or mean. was that not the case? I spoke, I've spoken about this kind of stuff before, particularly when mm. in the games industry, because uh, there were a lot of introverted people. Exactly. Yeah. And so a lot of people ask this question a lot. Mm. Um, when I was, I, I'm not, my first four years at Eton, I did not enjoy. Mm -hmm. Like I was bullied for sure. And I didn't fit in. Uh, and I'm, I put that almost entirely down to my weight. And then because of my weight and because of the social environment, no doubt I was incredibly annoying as well. <laughs> um, uh, but due to the fact that I kind of, I feel like I matured very quickly because I had been ill um, mm -hmm. and the things that I had experienced when I was a bit younger than that, yep. uh, particularly through prep school and things like that. I had a really tough time there as well. Um, I think I became very analytical about people. Um, I think I understand people very well. Um, and I think I'm very empathetic. Mm -hmm. um, and it allows me to see things from other points of view. So even when people were treating me badly, I think I got to the point where, particularly after I lost all my weight, I think I saw people very differently. And for a, and I think that for when I was younger, that wavered between incredibly cynical mm -hmm. um, and very understanding. So I think if anyone ever asked for help, I was always very, very helpful. But if anyone acted badly or um, treated somebody else badly, I would be very cynical. Um, as I've matured, I've come to understand that everything's a matter of circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about the context of which a person's in working. And I understand the way I felt a lot better. Um, but um, I kind of led a double life. So after I lost all my weight, I was a cool kid, right? Yeah. But I was a cool kid who also liked going and playing Magic the Gathering. <laughs> um, and I kind of led um, this kind of double life. Um, I'd still say that my closest friends were all the nerdy friends, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. um, and I'd still say to this day, they'd, they'd be my closest friends. And that might be because of the cynical period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, I definitely led a double life. And as I got older and older, they kind of got closer and closer together. And I think, I think, when I, I think the point at which I started my games company was the point at which... I came across, there were so many people in my life, although they were colleagues and things like that, who were introverted. Mm -hmm. I sort of stopped being like having this sort of secondary persona and I adopted just being a nerdy person who was also cool. Yeah. yeah. If you know what I mean? Or stereotypically cool. And also the, the whole thing about like programmers and geeks and all that coming, coming, coming cool also happened during this period of time. So mm -hmm. it all kind of culminated in this kind of split started leaving. And I started sort of talking to my friends who uh, would only play like rugby or something like that. And they would never play computer games mm -hmm. in like a more sort of like, hey, have you played this game? And they'd be like, no. And I'd be like, we should play. 
Yeah. And they'd be like, okay. And some of them didn't like it and some of them actually did. And mm. um, so I think I kind of led this double life. Um, and so, yeah, I think I was probably shy and a bit introverted during those years up until that point. Mm. And yeah, eventually they kind of merged together and uh, it, it was it was kind of a relief. It was a really nice feeling. I never really thought it bothered me, but I guess it, I guess it kind of did. Yeah. Do you think that's like an age thing? Because you're talking about you had kind of two sets of friends, but do you think it's the kind of thing where as people get older, they're going to be more open and more, more kind of, yeah. And it's also the time sort of in our lives in the world with like the Zuckerbergers becoming billionaires. And yep. They're very, like you say, stereotypically nerdy, but it sort of changes it when it becomes cool in the form of Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's a whole bunch of factors. I think the fact that everyone matures becomes like a bigger thing. You're not mm. forced to hang around with people you don't like, right? Yeah, like exactly. it's very different when you're a school, especially boarding school. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think it's a it's 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 an am amalgamation of all of that. And I kind of feel like I approached that a lot earlier than a lot of people. I think that's kind of something I would have even wanted at school, like so when mm -hmm. I was like 18. Yeah. But um, I kind of didn't think it would work. So I didn't even bother trying to pursue it. Mm -hmm. I just kept it separate. Um, but from both sides, like nerdy people don't want jocks coming to their nerdy yeah, evenings. Yeah. Not because they feel bad about it, it's just because they just don't like them, <laughs> right? And, and, and vice versa, it, it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, it's, I think it's that, but, and also the, the mature, so as people become more, more, more mature, like people are happy to go like, I don't want to do that. And when yeah. they go, I don't want to do that, then you're not in an environment where you feel animosity towards anyone. So yeah. like you can hang out with somebody you don't really know very well or got on with because it's, there's like no commitment. It's, there's, no, mm -hmm. there's nothing forced there. It is a certain level of maturity, but it's also the circumstances of all those people change. Mm -hmm. And then once again, there's the, there's the fact that, you know, you get people like Elon Musk coming out being like some of the coolest people in the world exactly. and, and they're nerds. They play games, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like Elon Musk, like most of his patents come out of computer games. So and then he goes out with Amber Heard and you're like, oh, maybe he is a bit cooler than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, um, I, th I think that uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, I think that uh, he himself would admit that he's not got, he's not the most uh, mentally stable person. No, I was actually, I'm reading yeah. his like biography at the moment. Yeah. Interesting. Well, would, you describe, would you describe him as almost the mad genius or? No, no, no I would say uh, an incredibly emotionally mm. driven founder um, and a brilliant man. Um, when he talks about his employees, he gets upset. You can see that he like visibly cares. Like yeah. uh, there's some really fun videos. Um, I find them fun because I <laughs> love looking at the different personalities of like him and Jeff Be Bezos and their mm -hmm. mentality towards business. And it's like, yeah. oh, like what are you doing? At like, uh, what what happens if your employees have a problem? And like, and Jeff's just like, I'm in bed at ten. Like you know, I'm aging in reverse. That's my goal right <laughs> <Yeah>. now. <laughs> like, and and Elon Musk is like, I'm ready to talk to my employees and solve a problem at any time, no matter what. 3 a.m. Mm. Like super emotional. Like you can see he's like visibly tired in the interview that he's getting about that. And I think there's just I'm not saying one's right or wrong. Mm. It's just one's like a lot more emotional. And I, I'd say he's a very emotional person. Well, yeah. he opened up on Twitter, didn't he, to everyone sort of to critique his cars. Oh. He was like literally tell me any problem that we've got in yeah. the cars and i am going to do my best to, to yeah. solve that problem yeah, he, he 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 um well as a gamer he embraces the game that's what the games industry is like that's yeah. the best way it's to deal way. with the games industry as well and i think that's also the be actually the best way to deal with social media to solve a problem you've got to be told that there is a problem and someone's not getting you, the you, best experience you, you humanize your company like mm. once you once a business gets to a certain size it becomes inhuman and therefore people treat it as an inhuman object people complain people like throw their toys out the pram people will try to game it people will hate large businesses mm. a way to stop people hating a large business is to make it human and the way you make it human is you make the most important person in that business or the most important people in that business have a face mm. because then when people are like mouthing off and there's problems let's say like the tesla's got an issue they're not complaining to a company they're complaining to a human being who has shown that they genuinely care and then it's about whether you believe them or not mm. right but in, in pretty much everyone's case, I'm sure they believe Elon Musk that he genuinely yeah. wants to build incredible things and, yeah. like, and, and he wants to give them to people. Yeah, I think Elon Musk to me is like the perfect representation of somebody doing something purely because they love it. Yeah. And I don't know, like you're talking about Jeff Bezos as well. Uh, Jeff Bezos' business is better, um, mm. like fundamentally. Yeah, but um, as a, I don't know, as a person, I just warm to Elon Musk more purely yeah. because of like the 
the ideas mm. behind it and like his personality. Well, he's an um, he's an emotionally and engaging person. Yeah, right? like it's it's a lot e- easier to empathize with people. It's much easier to project with somebody like that. Um, I think that um, all the greatest leaders um, now in a social media age where people can feel close to people who they're actually a long way away yeah. from, mm-hmm. if you can show like those emotional sides to yourself, you you engage very very strongly. Um, I would say that Jeff Bezos is a more traditional leader. Um, I, 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 I can't say I know anywhere near as much about him, but he's built an incredible business and he's incredibly smart. Like it, it's kind of like right now, if you're a business and you're thinking about what you're going to do, the thing you least want to hear is Amazon is planning on diversifying into your sector. Like yeah, that yeah, is literally yeah. like the scariest thing you could possibly ever hear right now. Like, it's, and, and the thing is, it's not even like small businesses. It's any sized business. Mm. If they go like, oh, we're going to go after movie industry. Like, so for example, Netflix and uh, Netflix is investing the most into a new IP by a mm. significant margin. It's like, it's almost like 80 times if I remember the graph like last year against okay. Paramount Studios, right? Yeah. Like, and then, uh, and then you think, and then people don't think about it, right? But Amazon Video is somewhere in the middle. They're like, they're still bigger than all, they're still putting more money into unique content than all of the movie, uh, all of Hollywood. I, I think he's an incredible businessman. Like, he's not an emotional businessman. No, yeah. But, um, and, mm. uh, but yeah, in a social media age, obviously an emotional businessman is far more easy to engage with. Okay, uh, so uh, Jeremy, so you've started the games company. Yep. Um, what, what happened next? So you've sort of become successful building this game and then what happened? So, um, as I said, the media kind of took off. Like, it was very, very exciting. We were a very fast-growing business. We had, like, a 9.8 out of 10 score on all the indie sites. Like, okay. we were, like, the exciting, big, next-generation sandbox for indies. Like, uh, it was a very exciting time for me, for my team, and just actually for the games industry, mm-hmm. for any indie at that time. It was a very exciting time. Um, my team became fantastic, uh, which is always i now know my favorite thing about companies Mm -hmm. is building amazing teams like i love my teams um they're like family like i genuinely care about Mm -hmm. every single person who works with me like that they become like better and better all the time i let them always want to learn what they want to learn yeah i'm always trying to think like oh well what what would they be interested in when i'm reading about things which would be useful technologies for our business i'm thinking about all of my my team and thinking oh who would like to learn that like who would who wants to do this who would be the best but also who wants to right Mm -hmm. um but anyway so the uh the games company got into a point where we were lit we were ready to kind of go we were a few months development out um, and I can't go into a huge amount of detail about what was going on, sure. um, mostly because I don't know what I'm technically allowed to and not allowed to say. Yeah, fair enough, yeah. Um, but I can say that we were in a position where we needed a little bit more money to launch, and it was a very insignificant amount, even more insignificant than I thought at the time, given that how much money we raise now and like what I know about investment yeah. these days. Um, and... Um, the uh, acting CEO at Jagex Game Studios at the time there basically tried to devalue us even though our game was likely to be more successful than most of their IP and try to dilute me out. Okay. Um, and I probably wasn't the most mature human being at that point in time. Uh, and I was also very emotionally involved. Like I was tired. We had worked so hard on this game, right? So very, very emotional, very tired. Um, and... I basically said no and moved my whole team out of the office, paid them their salaries um, a month or maybe two months in advance and helped find them other jobs um, and moved out of the building. And uh, got a phone call from this guy like about a month later, literally, oh, have you considered my offer? I was like, are you stupid? Like, yeah. <laughs> we're not even in the building anymore. <laughs> <laughs> We've literally like, they literally fired half of their staff cool. that year. Like 300 employees were gone because of a failed game. Um, and I was just like, how do you not even know? Like your building's like empty. Yeah. This just shows. That shows I, I, it's a bit yeah. of a giveaway. Yeah. yeah. And, point, and, I, and I definitely mouthed off. I was just like, you don't, you just know what the fuck you're doing. Right? Yeah. And um, I said, you want the game, you can buy it from me. And I sold it for pretty much peanuts again. I was just very emotionally drained at that point. I'd, I'd lost my team, which I loved so much. Um, and it was a, it was a really tough time for me. I think uh, once again, my trust, yeah. I felt betrayed. Mm. I genuinely felt that way. Um, and I went through a period of about, 
I basically just got like super obsessed with learning new stuff on my own. But during that period in Cambridge, I basically didn't leave my flat. Um, I, ha- I I automated the whole thing. My landlord hated me. <laughs> uh, so I had like sensors everywhere, like the plugs were off the walls and I could walk into my kitchen. I jerry rigged my Xbox so that I could like automate my toaster and never <laughs> say good morning to me when I walked in. I was, I was a little bit nuts. So I, I oh. just like, I basically just got like super obsessed with Internet of Things stuff before Internet of Things became a thing. <laughs> um, and um, because of that, I learned more programming languages. But uh, it was, I was doing that for maybe six to nine months. And one day, my girlfriend was just like, well, Jeremy, that you've got a, why don't you get a co-founder? And I was just like, well, I could. <laughs> and she was like, you've got to do something. You're driving yourself insane here. Like, yeah. you're literally going crazy. So eventually, I went on to the, uh, I went on London Startups Group on Facebook. Mm-hmm. I went, hi, um, I'm a technical founder, and I'm looking for a co-founder who's already got an idea. And I basically, and, and at that time, and still now, technical co-founders are, particularly ones with a solid track, like a really strong track record, mm-hmm. are very rare. And I got inundated with contacts, like literally just like bombarded with people yeah. telling me their ideas. Like I had one guy who wanted to build like a VR related exercise equipment for mainstream gyms and stuff like that. So you could gamify exercise. Um, I had like uh, an art company, which is less said about that than better and um amongst all of these i've one day got li- i got a message from this guy called um nick sheck <laughs> he's like i've got his proper name on uh <laughs> okay so it's nicholas <laughs> Shekadani, my, my current co-founder um and he sent me a message uh so bearing in mind that this guy's like uh, he must have been like the end of his first year or maybe the beginning of his second year at oxford yeah. at that yeah. point and you know um just was just like hey um he hijacked a thread while I was talking on with somebody else on really? Facebook. It was just like, hey, can I give you a call? I sent him a message. I was like, yeah, sure, fine, ring me. So he rang me and he was like, hey, um, I want to build a mobile app. At that point, it was a mobile app um, where students can have one profile and apply to many jobs. Mm-hmm. I was like, great. That sounds really cool. I get it. I struggled not getting a job. Mm-hmm. It immediately emotionally hit me. I became interested and I, I, I engaged with him and he talked to me about like all of the issues. He already had a really strong business model on the idea that every single person like writes all these application forms for all these different companies and they all have a slightly different so you can't reuse it. And even if you did, it would still be like loads of copying and pastings. Yeah. Law firms, it's like a four hour minimum application and if you're spending your time on it, it's like days. Yeah. And this is all happening during a period of time when you're most stressed. You're like reaching your final year exams. You mm-hmm. look, you're hoping you're going to get your internships, particularly for the professional service related grad schemes. And um, I totally got it. And I just went, this is a perfect solution for machine learning. Yeah. He was like, mm-hmm. what's machine learning? I was like, you would know every, you would know who got hired at every single one of these businesses. And he was like, well, I guess. And I just was like, that means you could predict exactly who everyone would hire you would know which student a company would select before it happened. And so okay. the first version of Head Start was born. And the idea was is that you could tell students what they needed to do and also where they were most likely to be able to get in. Mm-hmm. So you could tell somebody from their filling in their profile, like you've got like an 86% chance of getting into Accenture based on everyone else who's previously been yeah. hired there. Um, and then the next step, which we didn't get to yet, we will do it eventually, but it's not a high priority anymore, is being able to tell people what to learn. So if you, for example, are 14 and you're like, I want to be a, an investment banker, uh, we would be able to tell you exactly what things you would need to do in order to acquire the skills okay. to be able to do that job. Mm-hmm. And so we ended up ch- chatting for like four hours the first time we ever spoke, um, just talking about this late into the night. Um, <laughs> Nick has a funny story where apparently he was on the phone and his dad had walked into it and he was like, what are you doing? He's just, I'm on the phone talking about work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, um, apparently that, that I, I didn't notice. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I was probably ran- I was probably like rambling off about like how this was like amazing, exactly, and we could like yeah. completely change the way recruitment works, and we could like empower students to be able to like change the way that selection is done. So it's not based on grades; it's based on who you are. Uh, we came up with the whole like person, not paper, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and yeah, that that was when Head Start was kind of born. Basically, and what yeah. year was that? That would have been uh, twenty, the end of 2015, okay. I think. And then 
then what happened? So you've I, had this four hour conversation. I had a bunch of random stuff I was doing, like consultancy stuff, web stuff, just to you know, pay bills. So I had a few projects I had to finish up. Uh, so I did that over about six months, on and off, maybe like three or four, three or four months. Uh, and then we started working on uh, Head Start full time. We got an office in Summertown, which so surreally is walking distance from my prep school. And uh, we took a little serviced office there and uh, Nick would come out when he wasn't, didn't have lectures and I would work on it, programming the very first versions mm-hmm. of our application. I think I wrote, I think I wrote the first version of our app like three times in like two different languages. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. That's nice. Yeah. So that that was where that's where Head Start was born. Okay. So then, so you built the first version yourself. Yes. And which, then, which was a mobile application. Okay. And a web application, but we prioritized the mobile one because it's now on website as well. Because all three of us have signed yeah, up, <laughs> been oh, through it, just checking. Yeah. How, how did you find it? Was it okay? Any yeah, bugs? I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> happily employed, so I can't uh, <laughs> apply too many other places. Um, <laughs> but no, you you two boys have graduated, Henry. And yeah. Tom, you've both graduated yeah. in the last six months, so you've been looking in the market that the app is primarily designed for. Exactly. I think the biggest thing for, for me was applying to so many different graduate schemes or, or, or kind of jobs in that sense. It is such a time-consuming process, and eliminating that time just to one application is, is such a good idea in that sense. And then going through the app, it, it, everything ran so smoothly. It was so user-friendly, and, and that really stood out to me personally. Yeah. Because there's, mm. I've noticed a lot, especially like the f- after sort of September to December time when I was properly trying to look for jobs. There's so many, uh, I don't want to say similar things, but there's so many things coming out where there's people saying, look, uh, try this program, try this website, we'll be yeah. able to find you a job. Yeah. And you go on there and there's like two or three jobs, which none of them are relevant. Yeah. And I think, especially for somebody who doesn't know what they want to do, yep. that could be the perfect thing. Yep. And also I just massively support the idea that it's not about it's just about the person because i think there's too much i mean this is from little to no experience but i think there's too much on oh uh you don't have enough experience to do this you didn't have enough experience to do that and it's kind of like what you were saying earlier i think that you know you you bring people you brought people on who had no programming experience and taught them how to program like i believe that it's about the person and a person could be taught to do any job if they liked it and if you were good enough yeah like so so what one of our best developers right now a guy called uh christos dimitrilas he was a nuclear power station engineer didn't know how to program went on a coding course he's now us i would say our second strongest programmer and he only started programming a year ago <laughs> he's an, a year and three months ago now mm. actually he's a absolute monster it just shows with the right kind of training and the right uh, support behind uh, an employee anything is possible really i think um yeah i think the training and support is important but mm. i actually don't think it's the requirement i think it's the person i think it's the yeah, person yeah, wanting yeah. to learn and the the environment that they don't put up doesn't put up any barriers so yes it needs to be the right environment as well but it doesn't need to be a supportive environment mm-hmm. i think the right person as long as they're in an environment which doesn't stop them doing what they want to do yeah, yeah. then they'll then they'll ex- then they'll attitude more than exactly. anything yeah. it, it really does like you can when when i interview candidates i can tell very quickly how, that if they can if they're going to be an amazing developer like mm-hmm. very very quickly i hired one one of our other developers i hired based up on how he described how he played league of legends really yeah <laughs> Because he basically said, I probably, he said, I remember exactly in his interview, he said, I think I spend more time watching myself play than play. And I watch and I like mark down all the little mistakes I make. And then the next time I play after doing this, Mm -hmm. I will make sure that I don't make those mistakes. And I was just like, you're going to be so good at learning how to program. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And um, he he actually had a conversation with me a, a, a couple of weeks after he had started. And he was just like, you didn't give me any coding tests. Like, why did you hire me? Like he, he, he's somebody who needs to see his constant progression because he's, he's a gamer, right? Yeah. He's used to having a score. He's used to being like, I'm better than this person because I got this. Like, I won, right? And uh, he said, you, you hired me without even giving me a test. How do you know I'm good? And I was like, I told him, I, I told him what I just told you. And he was just like, that's ridiculous. And I was like, look, okay, you want to break it down like this? You've been here how long? He's like, three months. Right? I was like, okay, great. When you arrived here, what could you do on your own? And he mm-hmm. said, oh, I could have like built something. I was like, right now, if I took you to the side and do you think you could probably build absolutely anything you ever want to do right now? And he was like, probably. It would take me a while, but probably. Yeah. And I said, do you think you've grown? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, he's, he's working on it. We, we talk about it. And I think he's actually recently become um, much more comfortable. It's, he's, I love my whole team. They're all yeah. great. They're really, really great. 
So you've built the first version of the app. Like I kind of want to know a bit about um, how do you sort of attract the companies to buy into this as well? Well, this is Nicholas, right? Nicholas is an incredible salesman. He yeah. is very, very, very good at sales. Um, and uh, very, very good at um, getting somebody's belief, yeah. uh, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and and, and, and uh, selling a dream. Fantastic at selling a dream. We had, um, <laughs> we had contracts uh, lined up with both Vodafone and L'Oreal uh, before we even had a completely finished product. Okay. Um, and that's because we were solving an incredibly painful issue. Yeah. So these companies have this big issue and we were able to deliver in time because Nick would sell the dream, right? Like he would sell, this is what we're going to do. We're going to solve all these problems. It's going to be the best candidate experience. We were selling it from the candidate's point of view as well. So we were saying we've got all these talented students mm -hmm. um, and um, it, it, it just worked out it just worked out really well. We had a sort of all these culmination of all these things kind of came together. Nick just t took off and just became an amazing sales, dream salesman and like kind of visionary, right? Um, for how he could see recruitment being candidate centric. It's all about the candidate is the powerful one. You know, the candidate is choosing you and telling companies like, you want the best candidates? You need to make the candidate want to come and work for you. Yeah, and it was, yeah. and, and th that year in recruitment, that was the message. It was around the fact that they're not are getting a diverse enough set of people applying. Um, and then he, they would be like, okay, well, can you do it? Who are you? You're like some kid at Oxford, like, you know, doing Chinese studies. You've had a business before, but like, no, why, no one else in the recruitment industry has done this. So like, why should we believe you? And then he would just be like, well, I've got Jeremy. And then I'd come in and I'd be like, well, this machine learning, that this is how we can prove that we can do this. We can give you diversity statistics, which you've never been able to have before. We can tell you where bias is and any part of your recruitment process, all of this kind of stuff. And they'd just be like, okay, cool. And then they would sign. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was how we got our first traction. We were able to raise uh, money, family and friends, just like always um, is easiest at the beginning. It's very difficult to raise money at the very, very beginning. Definitely super hard times. Um, and, uh, we just went from strength to strength. We obviously pivoted um, mm -hmm. before Y Combinator at the beginning of the summer um, so that we, we felt that we could have a bigger impact if companies actually used us as their recruitment software as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because then we can track the candidate from end to end and we can truly measure the whole process. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we're already at the point now where we can literally tell companies how biased they're being at every single step in the process. Uh, all the way up to uh, up to video interview stage because we don't have a inter video interviewing platform mm -hmm. yet. Yeah, it's <laughs> sneak peek. Yeah. But it is, <laughs> it is a win-win for both the candidate and the company, isn't it? Because they're being matched purely on what they are like as businesses right. and sort of making matchmaking an employee and an employer. Yeah, I mean, like, it's a win-win. It yeah. is a total win-win. Mm. You turn around to a company, you go, you want the candidate who wants to work at your business and will also end up performing the best, just like your high performers at your company currently, right? And they go, yes. It's like, then why are you using grades as a selection criteria? Mm. Why aren't you mm. using people as the selection criteria? And they go, oh, because it's hard. Yeah, it is hard, but you know that's what we do. Mm. And now it's possible to do that. So, I think from a purely selfish point of view on my behalf, mm. I when I first looked at Head Start, I only looked at it kind of from me. So I thought, oh, this is going to be a, a brilliant uh, experience for the applicants. Yeah. And I just didn't um, appreciate the, the ease that would, that would kind of inform on the on the companies that are yeah. recruiting as well. Yeah. Mm. I mean, like on that specific point, so we've, we've just finished our first big recruitment cycle with our new software stack, right? Yep. Um, I can't say the client name, but what I can say, the industry average for people completing an application is somewhere around... 30%. Mm -hmm. We had a 92% completion yeah. rate. Yeah, there are, there are certainly ap applications that I've started and and haven't finished. Well, one, one of the ones... <laughs> so we were doing a competitor analysis, right, for our investment while we were over in YC. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were like, okay, well, we need to show how our candidate experience is better. So we were like, okay, let's video an application process at another company. So mm -hmm. it got to the point where it's like, put in your work experience. We're like, company name, Google. This company does not exist. <laughs> and I was literally like, what? <laughs> I was like, we don't even have to try and find problems with our application yeah. process at this, at this, at this rate. Um, I'm not going to name who that yeah. is. But, uh, it is, they, they control about 30% of the recruitment market really? at the enterprise level. Yeah. It's just crazy. So are there, are companies sort of starting to recruit 
purely through Head Start now? Um, or is it still... We're getting close. We're getting very close. Um, mm. There are a lot of internal issues with businesses. And your point that you made earlier and that candidates think about it from the candidate point of view, the, the problem is just as bad, if not worse, for companies. Like, yeah. it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Like, uh, Starbucks gets 26,000 applications a day. Yeah. A day, mm. right? Like, how do you filter that fairly? Yeah. How do you find the best? You just can't. There's nothing. Which is why they, they then rely on grades, isn't it? Yeah. Because they, they rely on what they can cut people out with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? So we're getting really, really close. So internally, companies, right, they're huge. Particularly, <coughs> our, our best clients are very large enterprises. We, we are literally the perfect solution for massive businesses because we have the best talent pooling system because every single candidate in our platform has a match score, right? So let's say you have a popular role and then you have 50 less popular roles. As a recruiter, when you apply, you apply for a role, right? Yeah. What happens if that role, you're really, really good, but that role's got like amazing people in it, right? Like, you know, like PhD physicists or something mm-hmm. like, right? But then they've got all these other roles and they, nev- they don't manage to fill them. This is actually a serious problem for large businesses. Like Accenture, for example, struggle to fit, fit, fill their offices, which aren't in London. Like the ones which are in more rural locations, but a lot of people would take that job. Yeah. They'd just be like, no, I really want to work at Accenture and like, yeah. I'll do that for a few years and then I'm sure I can move internally or something, right? Mm-hmm. But they apply for the ones in specific locations or whatever, right? Whereas, so what, what we allow is because we have a match score for every role on our platform for every candidate, this allows us to actually, when you click on a candidate, you can see all of the roles in your business and their match score for every single one of them okay. and their status for all of them. Mm-hmm. And so the functionality which we're actually about to release is as a company will be able to head start candidates mm. for role, other roles at their company. So it, independent teams can actually see the candidates who've already applied to Amazon, so want to work at Amazon, yes. and then can essentially be like, okay, well, that role is actually oversubscribed, so let's head start them for these roles. And then the candidate can say, oh, yeah, no, I'd like to be considered for that role too, just by clicking a link in an email. Mm. Like... It's, it's like yeah. yeah, it's getting rid of the dead end, isn't yeah. it? Because it would just be, oh, I've applied to that job, it's a no, and then you think, oh, well, that's the end of that road. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And instead, exactly. it just gets filtered down, and the awareness of other roles that they yeah. otherwise wouldn't be aware yeah. of are literally put in front of them. Yeah. So I realise I've moved away from the original question, no, which was a full end to end, mm. full end to end um, adoption. Um, we are full end to end within certain functions within mm-hmm. certain businesses. So mm. early talent is where we're focused right now. Because not necessarily because it's what we're best at, it is what we're very, very good at. Yeah. But um, it's also because of the fact that um, within large enterprises, those sectors actually can almost run separate in a budget way. Yeah. So they can actually use a different piece of software than what the whole business would use. And as much as I would love it to be easy for a, a, a massive enterprise like across the whole globe mm-hmm. to switch software like that, that is not something you do really, really quickly. That is something yeah. which nowadays with, for most companies i think we can do it a lot faster but for a lot of companies it takes years in some cases mm-hmm. um so are we being used end to end some companies yes but um without a doubt our platform is most valuable using end to end because you get that full end to end traction like for example we can tell people let's say somebody that runs an, a facebook advertising campaign for a particular like course or something yeah we can we can tell them more than who applied right we can tell them more than like what most advertising platforms will be able to do like this is how many people came from this advert and how many of them applied mm-hmm. we can go all the way through the process and tell them every single section where the person like not, got dropped out so we can say this advert had the highest number of applications but every single one of them got rejected at assessment center mm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, and what that means is that then they can look at their advertising not in a volume recruiting kind of way. They can look at it in a why. Are, mm. are we attracting the wrong people here? Like, or is it our assessment center that's got a problem? Do we have an? Are, are we racist? Right. Like, let's say it's like a particular area of London mm-hmm. or something like that, or or a particular part of the country. Um, it's it's it's. Um, we 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 can offer far more to people who use us end to end so it, it, it's only a matter of time before mm-hmm. the majority start adopting us that way sure. um, uh, I think what, another thing that I find interesting going back to kind of the, the matching and finding the appropriate candidate for the role yeah. is especially in early stages of the application process potentially um, these applicants don't necessarily know what they want to go into so yeah. I've certainly applied to a role from a, a big company um, and then done some of the testing psychometric testing and then they've come back and said oh you're not suited to this role, but then the the individual has to wait six months to apply for a different role. So yeah. as you said, if the company has the ability to 
headhunt and say, right, he's, he's clearly a, a successful candidate, but not for that role. If I can have him on a different role, that's such a huge benefit for, yep. for kind of all involved. And, um, and no, no software currently exists which allows companies to do that. It's yeah. not a company's fault. They genuinely just haven't been able to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what they're trying to fix. Yeah. So, yeah. It's also really interesting the way that you spoke about that. It reminded me of like such a simple issue all the way back when uh, in, in the very first versions when Nicholas and I first met, which was kind of like a gold mine in disguise, which is everyone applies to jobs being what they think that company wants them to be. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like, and this is something we spoke about so much at the beginning, and it's important. It's actually, I should have remembered it, but it, it happens when you get like further down the rabbit hole, right? Yeah. Um, is, is, is that when people apply for a job, you apply as the pers- the version of yourself which you think is most likely to get a role there when yeah. you actually have no idea what it's like to even have a job there. Yeah. Yeah. You don't even know what the job really is, mm. uh, particularly as graduates, right? Um, by having one profile, like by having one application of yourself, it forces you to be yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's good for a candidate because it means you'll be more likely to end up at a place you actually belong. But the other reason why it's actually really amazing is because for the first time, it'll mean companies will actually be looking at people like they're yeah. not just look they're not looking at you know in some cases hundreds of thousands of people who look the same yeah other than their grades then what choice do they have they mm-hmm. essentially have to so uh, we're also facilitating that and I, I think that that's um often overlooked because like a lot of systems still use traditional CVs or like any system that doesn't have like a centralized version of a person mm-hmm. basically suffers from this you mentioned early on about that there is obviously some success because you were you were, you were at the awards last night for the Forbes thirty yeah. under thirty. Yeah. So I just wanted to know how you actually had come from this great idea, and you've explained how it's successful, and then it was proved to be successful by being awarded this sort of quite uh, credible award. Yeah. Um, where's our success come from? A lot of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I, th- I think. Uh, one of the things which a lot of investors always say to us is that Nicholas and I make a perfect team. Mm. Um, we definitely don't see to eye on eye on everything. We uh, we fight like pretty regularly, but in a healthy way, and um, we complement each other's skill sets incredibly well. Mm-hmm. Nicholas is a, a super strong, outward facing, very good salesman, great with investors, great at. Um, identifying a pain, he's very, very good at identifying pain points for people, um, f- for himself and for others. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, for me, I'm very team focused. I'm very about building a perfect culture. Um, I'm, I, 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 personal development for every individual in my company is like my number one priority. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause I know that, you know, my dream is to have, you know, one of the best technical teams in the world. Like that's, that's, that's what I want. I want people to go when they're going, oh, where do I want to go and work? I want people to go Netflix, Evernote, you know, maybe Google and Facebook will still be up there, although they're becoming less popular. Mm-hmm. It'd be like Head Start. I want, I want Head Start to be in that, that list. I want, mm-hmm. I want people to want to come and work with us. Not because like they have to, because they want to work with amazing people, right? Um, and, and, and you can see that those two types of people, like we make a very, very strong team. And I think that that's one of the reasons we got into Y Combinator. Mm-hmm. which definitely was a really strong platform for us. Still, most incredible network, fantastic advice. Both Nicholas and I went through, uh, particularly Nicholas, but both of us went through substantial personal growth there. Again, particularly around our messaging, particularly around um, really concentrating on what's important. They're mm-hmm. very, very good with that messaging. Um, and then, you know, we identified that being a consumer product, we wouldn't be able to grow internationally. We wouldn't be able to offer a genuine enterprise solution. So we had this thing which was like fantastic for volume recruitment, but we, we would have to capture the market first. We'd have to emotionally mm, yeah. under, like, make all young people believe in another job platform, yeah. which is hard, right? Mm. And I think that that moment when we realized that we could become the front end of a recruitment process and then when they get rejected, be like, hey, don't worry, man. Like, it's okay. Like, we've got some other jobs for you. You can apply to them with one click now because mm. you because this company uses Head Start because they're awesome. They care yeah. about you. Um, I think that that moment for us realized that we could then move into any market because we didn't even have to fully understand that market. We just have to understand people mm-hmm. because the companies understand those markets. You can we could, we, could, we could launch with a company which has an office out in Tel Aviv uh, and they could be like, we need to hire engineers out here and we'd be like, great, cool. Tell them to apply. Yeah. 
and, and, and fundamentally, people, people aren't all the same, and a lot of our algorithms include information which is heavily localized, but, but it's a lot easier than selling it to every single country in the world and every single individual, particularly in an area like job hunting. The skepticism, like, I'm skeptical. Mm. Every single time I see a job advert, I'm just like, how much of this is true? Did this person even read this job advert? Mm. Does this platform actually offer me roles? Like, all of these kind of things. And like, I wish Head Start was being used by literally like all SMEs and all enterprises because then we could genuinely literally say like this is your perfect job and we could help people find like things which they'd be happy doing the whole time mm -hmm. like that that just that would just make me feel so good um that'll happen in time hopefully yeah <laughs> um but yeah I think I think that was the really big moment where we went where where Head Start went from like a really cool idea that was executing really really well and we were solving some pain points to a company which you know why, why accommodate a billion dollar company right mm. like i mm. think that was the moment that that happened it was it was that decision to basically be able to capture a a capture is a scary word but it, it is essentially that from a business terms it's to capture an audience who doesn't even know that we can help them yet yeah do you know what i mean like without yeah. us having to acquire them um and uh, it's good for companies because when they reject people they're not going to be as sad they can literally go like when somebody says we're really sorry you're just not you're just not a good fit like they can earnestly say it they can literally mm. say like because when we can go our platform we can go we can turn and say like you're a really good fit for these companies you should apply you'll probably get the job mm -hmm. do you see what i mean yeah. yeah and 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 um the companies who are already using head start believe in that wholeheartedly like they're they're all great they have their problems every enterprise every large every every business has its problems right but i i can say like wholeheartedly every single business with us is, is trying to change mm -hmm. like a hundred percent and is, is this from your career so far is this your favorite is this what you're most excited about doing and growing uh as i said the thing which i care about the most is my team yeah i love my, my i love my team um i would say that this is the highest potential team i've ever had before okay um mostly because it's completely industry agnostic um i i it's also because they're the most recent so it's difficult right i've lost touch with a fair number of my previous teammates um i'm definitely comparing between my games company and here um and it's kind of like a mixture between my old passion and what i realized was my real passion mm -hmm. so my old passion was i want to make amazing games and make crap tons of people super happy and addicted and like like super love playing these things and like help them escape um to realizing that actually i just really love building amazing teams with amazing people mm -hmm. and um so it, it's hard but I'd, I'd probably say my current team is the best team i've ever had and um I, i'm proud of every single one of our employees okay perfect so jeremy just looking to kind of wrap up the session we're, we're looking to kind of ask one final question to our guests i guess okay um so kind of what advice would you give a a kind of potential entrepreneur um, looking back at your career so far, that, would, that would, you would feel would be useful to them? I got asked this question by an Uber driver the other day. Really? And, <laughs> and, I, gave, and I gave him one answer, and yeah. I said, always try really, really hard. Because mm -hmm. then even if you fail, like, you, will, you won't regret it, and you'll be proud enough to keep trying. Yeah. Um, and then I ran back, and I knocked on the window. <laughs> Literally, like, I think I, I got pretty far. The only reason I got back was because the traffic was so bad. So I ran back over um, and I said to him, never take anything at face value. And I think that that's actually more true now than ever. I think that being inquisitive uh, about why something is the way it is is incredibly important. And actually, when I listen to what Elon Musk gives in these kind of abuses of mm -hmm. environments, he, he talks about breaking things down to their bare essentials, like breaking things down all the way to the root of the problem. I think it's the same thing. Yeah. I think fundamentally it's truly understanding why something is the way it is. Why are batteries so expensive? Yeah. Oh, it's because what, what are batteries made of? And it, it talks about like, oh, it's this liquid. It's this particular metal. Does it have to be that metal? Could it be a different metal? Um, and I think that that's actually applicable to non-product based things too. I think it's applicable to people. I think it's applicable to your own decision making. Uh, I think that's an incredible well way to self-analyze why you do things. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a really good way to be introspective. So I would say that. I'd say question pretty much everything, but mm. not in a cynical way, in a way just because you're curious. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome stuff. I think that's the kind of perfect note to end it on. Um, so Jeremy, massive, massive thank you for coming on. That was 
uh, such an amazing insight, I think, speaking for the three of us. Oh, thank um, you. It was really fun. Um, I will say, if you're a graduate looking for a job or a student looking for a job, go check out Head Start, Henry Martin. Um, and I think that's going to be it from all of us. So thank you very much for listening. I've been Tom West. I've been Ross Jeffries. And for as long as I can remember, I've been Henry Martin. Thank you. <laughs> Done. The bows are shown. The bows are shown. The bows are shown.